Hello, Keith Kaiser here with another lesson from God's Word. We're looking at Luke's life of Christ in Luke chapter 5. Today we come to verse 27, Luke 5, 27. After these things he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, Follow me. So he left all, rose up, and followed him. Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house, and there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. And their scribes and the Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. There's a very interesting story here that we've read, which follows on from the great account of the Lord Jesus healing a paralyzed man. The man's friends had let nothing keep them from getting to the Lord Jesus. They went to this house where the Lord was teaching, though it was chock-a-block full of people. It was absolutely filled. They broke through the ceiling and let this man down into the midst. And the Lord not only pronounced forgiveness for his sins, but he also healed the man by his word. That caused a stir, not least among the Pharisees and the teachers of the law that were there. And again, we see this group encountering the Lord Jesus and the disciples, and they're not happy about what the Lord Jesus is doing. So we see that growing opposition to Christ and to his ministry. Now, it says that he went out and saw a tax collector. So he goes from sitting in a house where there are obviously religious people that are interested in the word of God, that they're concerned about the scriptures. They want this young rabbi to expound the scriptures to them. And now he comes to someone that the early readers of the New Testament would have been most surprised to see the Lord Jesus having dealings with. You know, so many people have the idea that Christianity is for good people and that when you're a good person, well, then you can be a good Christian. Well, it's exactly the opposite, you know. Christianity is composed entirely of sinners. But here's the difference. We are sinners saved by grace. In other words, sinners who've been pardoned from their sin, who've been justified, that is, declared righteous before God, legally because the Lord has paid our sin debt. He died for us on the cross, according to the scriptures. And by offering himself up as a propitiation, that righteous sacrifice where God judged him instead of us for those sins. And the Lord is able to say the debt's been paid and canceled, and now you're free and you can be declared righteous and made members of my family. That's the wonderful gospel we have. So we Christians are the first to say, I'm not righteous of myself. I'm not a Christian. I don't have eternal life because of what I've done. It's who the Lord Jesus is. He is my Savior. He died on the cross for me. He rose again to give me eternal life. And he is my hope. He's the one that I know will eventually come and take me to heaven and to the new heavens and the new earth and so forth. All of God's wonderful, glorious future plans are bound up with who the Lord Jesus is and what he's done and done for me. Not because I deserve it or because I'm better than someone else, but it's solely God's grace. God giving us this in Christ by his unmerited favor. Now, of course, our part is to agree with God, to confess that we are sinners, to repent, to say we don't want to be so any longer. We want to turn from that way of living. We want to stop our independence from God, and we want to trust in the Lord Jesus, to rely on him not only to give us the gift of salvation, but to empower us to live differently by his spirit and to change us to be exactly like him. Christians aren't sinless, it's been said, but we ought to sin less. And we find that as we abide in the vine and depend on the Lord, the Lord being the true vine, he produces fruit in us, the branches, what Galatians chapter 5 will call the fruit of the Spirit. And so we have a wonderful new life when we come to Christ. Now, the Lord Jesus was very zealous in going out and finding people who were not considered upright or not considered religious. And such would be this tax collector named Levi, uh, who also is called Matthew. The Gospel according to Matthew uh, was written by him according to uh, our by inspiration of the Spirit of God, using Matthew as the penman. And here was this man, Levi, sitting at the tax office. 
and the Lord Jesus comes and says, follow me. Now, why is that so shocking? Why is there an element of scandal about this story? Why is there this reaction with the scribes and the Pharisees? Well, they call these people, in verse 30, tax collectors and sinners. That's kind of all of a piece. The tax collector is a specifically bad kind of sinner, a most egregious type of sinner, because the tax collectors were collaborators with the Roman government. The Romans were an occupying power. In other words, the Roman Empire had conquered Israel. Israel was dependent. This was what the Lord would call later in the same gospel, the times of the Gentiles. And so they were under the authority of the Romans. They wanted freedom. They wanted independence. Uh, but there were people within the country who were willing to work with the Romans and in part work with them because the Romans tax system was notoriously corrupt. It was kind of a franchise system. They would give you the responsibility of collecting taxes in a certain place. And if you could get more than that, well, great. You know, you were uh, going to be somebody who was uh, able to enrich yourself. Now, Le Levi was not like Zacchaeus, whom we meet later in Luke in chapter 19. Zacchaeus was like a head tax collector. He had people like Levi working under him. Levi is more like at a toll booth. He's sort of the toll collector. And still, these people weren't considered um, high in society, not only in status and in social level, but morality. They were considered as participating in an evil system. And yet the Lord comes to this man and says, follow him. He says, follow me, verse 27. And verse 28, we see the response. So he left all, rose up, and followed him. Now, I want to say that anyone who comes to salvation through faith in Christ has to do this. It doesn't mean you physically get up and leave where you're living or leave your job or leave uh, what you've known and done and so forth. But morally speaking, spiritually speaking, this is what we do. When we hear the Lord Jesus say, follow me, we say, yes, my old life, it's gone. I, it's like I died on the cross. Jesus died for me, but he also died as me. And it's just like he was buried for me. I, I was buried with him and he rose again for me. So that's why Christians, once they've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says we are to be baptized. That's what the Lord commanded. And by being baptized, symbolically, we are saying we died with Christ. We were buried with him. We've risen again with him now to walk in newness of life, as Romans 6 and other passages would teach us. So this shows us that really coming to Christ is a radical departure from what's been before. We're not just adding a little Jesus to our life, like adding a little salt or pepper to our favorite culinary dish. No, this is an entire transformation to our lives. This is becoming a new creature in Christ Jesus. This is saying, that I'm not living for myself anymore. The life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, as Paul said in Galatians 2.20. And that's exemplified in Matthew or Levi's activities here, that he left all, rose up, and followed him. You know, we have to be able to say, take the world, but give me Jesus. All its joys are but a name, but his love abideth ever. That's the wonderful thing, you know. The Lord's not asking you to give up something that is really good in exchange for something that, well, maybe it's at the same level or maybe even a little less. No, when you give up the world to gain the Lord Jesus, my friend, you gain everything that's needed for life and godliness. You gain an eternity of blessing. You give up a little in this temporal life. You give up old things that were defiling in some cases, that kept you in bondage. You give up old sins and habits that weren't good for you and maybe that were destroying you, things that displeased God, certainly. And you give up some things that are indifferent, things that were unimportant for eternity. And those things now, you say, like the hymn writer said, the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And you see that happen uh, when you come to the Lord Jesus. He becomes all the more important for you. You're able to use what you have now for the glory of God. You're able to enjoy creation in a way that you never did. The hymn writer said, Heaven above is softer blue, 
Earth below is sweet or green. Something lives in every hue Christless eyes have never seen. So when you come to the Lord, you're able to enjoy the world in a way you never have before. You can enjoy food to the glory of God and give thanks to God for it. You can enjoy clothes. You can enjoy possessions and say, I want to use these for God's glory. How do I open my home and show hospitality to others? How do I use it as a place that's a beacon for the gospel? You can use your money to advance the gospel and to help the poor and to do different things that bring glory to God. You can use your time not only to serve the Lord and to spend time with the Lord and get to know the Lord better as you read his word and pray, but even in doing your hobbies, you can glorify God for it and say, God, I'm thankful that you made me one who liked to fish or hunt or cook or do crafts. You've given me creativity. You've given me the ability to draw or paint or write or whatever it is. And there are all kinds of things God gives us. And to the believer, he says he gives us these things richly to enjoy. So he wants us to enjoy them, but he wants us to enjoy them in himself. It's rather like with our children. We give them Christmas gifts or birthday gifts, and we love to see them enjoying those gifts. But what would you think if your child said to you, "Um, I'll just take the gifts, thank you very much. I don't really want to spend any time with you. I mean, I just want to play with my Legos or my airplanes or my army men or whatever it is that they receive. And they say, but I'm not really interested in spending any time with you. I'm not coming to Christmas dinner. I'm not coming to the Christmas celebration. Here's the address where I'm living. Mail me my toys. Well, a lot of people try to do that with God. They take the bodies God gives them, the minds God gives them, the time God gives them, the talents God gives them, the treasure God gives them, and they squander those things on themselves. If you are living for this life, the Lord Jesus said you're going to lose it. That if you keep your life, you'll lose it for eternity. But if you lose your life for my sake, you'll gain it for eternity. And eternity not only is a lot longer than time, but it is a lot better. Qualitatively, there is a difference as well as quantitatively. So Levi was not a fool, as Jim Elliot would later say it. And Philip Henry, Matthew Henry's father, said something similar about two centuries earlier. But the famous statement by Jim Elliot is, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And Jim Elliot uh, asserted that and also lived that because he laid down his life in his early 30s as a martyr for the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he testified to the reality of Christ and the gospel and the good news that that is. He was so willing to get that message out to the world and wanted people to know it and thought the Lord was worthy of everything, that he went forth preaching the gospel in a dangerous part of Ecuador, even knowing that the local people could be hostile. And indeed, they were hostile. They killed him and his four compatriots back in January of 1956. But through that story, many others in that tribe were won to Christ. Even the very murderers were brought to Christ. And so there's been a tremendous change affected among the Warani Indians and Uh, Even to this day, the gospel is going on in that part of Ecuador, and they're reaching out to others with it. So you can read about it in Through Gates of Splendor or In the Shadow of the Almighty, or there have been other books written about the five martyrs as well. But that exemplifies that principle that we're seeing here in Levi's story. Now, in response to the salvation, you see the joy in Levi's life, verse 29. Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house. And there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with him. And when someone comes to Christ, it's natural to want to reach your family and friends. And who were the people that he would be hobnobbing with socially and otherwise? Well, his workmates, other tax collectors, other people of the same station in life. And uh, he would bring these others. The others are just generically described by the scribes and Pharisees as sinners. So again, these aren't the people that are considered the fabulously righteous or the religious people of society but they're there and he's throwing a great feast why so that they can come and meet the lord jesus they can come and sit down and eat with him and that's a little picture of the kingdom itself that the lord speaks in the future about many coming from east and west and north and south and sitting down at table with abraham and isaac and jacob in the kingdom 
This is what the Lord wants. So many of his parables are about a wedding feast or a great feast of some kind and drawing people in. You see, this is a God who loves celebration and loves joy and loves the social aspect of humanity. He created us to have a relationship with us. And what he's bidding you to come to, what he's welcoming you to, is a loving relationship where you come and receive the Lord Jesus Christ and you're brought into eternal life. It starts here on earth. The moment you believe Christ, you have life. He who has the Son has life, says 1 John 5. But it goes on for eternity, and you can look forward to feasting with the Lord, to celebrating this salvation. And when he was questioned on this, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Verse 31, he responds, Jesus answered and said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I mean, who is going to receive the house call from the doctor? Does the doctor uh, go out seeking the well? Well, we do have wellness visits. I understand that concept. A checkup, as it used to be called. And yet, a doctor is so often spending their time dealing with the sick. A lot of us avoid doctors as much as possible unless we start to develop some kind of physical problem or sickness, and then we call the doctor. And so why would you criticize the doctor for going to sick people? You'd say, those are sick people. You shouldn't go to them. They're contagious. They could give you something. Well, again, we saw when the Lord Jesus healed the leper a few studies ago that for the Lord Jesus to come and interact with the sinner never brought the Lord Jesus lower. It never demeaned him. It never defiled him. The Lord Jesus never... Uh, joined in on the sin. But for a sinner to come to the Lord Jesus means that his cleansing comes to them and he lifts them up. And so he says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, undoubtedly, they thought they were among that class of people, the righteous. But again, I quote the Bible as Romans 3 would quote it from the Psalms. There's none righteous, no, not one. So in God's sight, none of us are righteous of ourselves. We can't come to God and say, well, you should let me into heaven because I've always been a good person. I've always done what I ought and never done what I should not. And we can never say that. We are unrighteous and we need a savior. What they should have said was, well, when you put it that way, come to think of it, we need a savior as well. We need that spiritual great physician. We need the one to heal us from our sins. And what we need is to repent, to change our mind about Christ. We thought that we didn't need him. We thought he was wrong. We thought he's going about things all wrong. Repentance is a change of mind resulting in a change of heart and life where we turn from the way that leads to destruction and we turn to the Lord and put our faith in him. We say, uh, we're not trusting in ourselves. We're not leaning on our understanding. We're now going to trust in the Lord with all our heart. We want to believe what he says and follow him. And that's repentance, to go after the Lord Jesus on that narrow road, to deny oneself and take up our cross, and to say that Christ is my only hope in life and death, as a recent Christian hymn puts it. And that's so important, to repent and believe the gospel, to repent and put our full confidence in the Lord Jesus to save us. We are not righteous. There's none righteous, no, not one. I don't say that. The Bible says that. That's God saying that. That's his word, putting it explicitly to us. And so we need a savior. We all need the great physician. And uh, we sing a hymn sometimes, my great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. His blood can make the phallus clean. His blood availed for me, another part of that hymn says. So what a wonderful thing it is to come to the Lord Jesus for acceptance and cleansing. He says, he that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. As they say on the insurance commercials, you cannot be turned down. You come to Christ, he won't toss you out. He'll receive you. Christ receiveth sinful men, an old hymn says, and it's still true today. He'll receive you, no matter who you are and what you've done. He'll save you to eternal life, a relationship with him, and to heaven, and he will save you from hell and judgment. May you come to him today. Thank you for listening.